How's everybody doing? Awesome. Um, so raise a hand. If, I can't really see anybody on the stage because I'm blinded up here. But you know, is your interest of this around the network traffic or analytics testing? Like analytics testing? Good. Yes. Awesome. All right. Awesome. Well, that's great. So kind of get this started. Um, Greg Seipel, Director of Quality Engineering. My, my whole objective is kind of what Claude was talking about. Um, this morning around his keynote is kind of building quality solutions for the devs to make sure that their lives are a lot easier in the sense of making sure testing is easy for them, but also we're you know kind of holding that accountability and everything. Um, Aaron's on stage, he works on my team, and he's going to be talking about the solutions he's built around automation for analytics and how we're using the extended debugger and everything. So who are we? You know, kind of think of the scale of a Gannett in the sense of we have 2,000 journalists 100 plus newsrooms, 124 million unique users hitting our network every, time, every month. But you also have 1.1 billion total page views across our whole entire network. But on top of that, we have built over 500 plus digital products from web, mobile web, native, VR, AR, and many more things. But Gannett is this leading you know, local to national media company and most of everybody here probably has heard of USA Today. But they may not realize that Gannett is also more than that. We are a lo the largest local media company in America with that 100 plus <clears throat> newsrooms that span across 34 states. We're one network with many voices and we're a team of innovators. And that's what really brought us here today to kind of like talk about the problems we're trying to solve. One of the biggest things for us is about the speed to production, having that reliability, accountability, but also build confidence when we're actually pushing code to production to ensure that we're testing early and often. By doing that, it's very critical for us that these 14 analytic providers are one, implemented correctly, but two, ensuring that they're actually firing off when a user accesses a particular page or video content across our whole network. Remember, 1.1 billion total page views per month hits our network, so analytic data is really critical for our business. And to do that and solve that problem, it really starts at the requirement state, making sure we have really clear requirements from, the, all the way from our business intelligence all the way down to the developer and testers. And all that really involves is really a tag management, training everybody, and the really key part of this is the monitoring and testing that we're gonna be talking about here today. The usability analysis and reporting. And that said, I'm gonna kick it over to Aaron. He's gonna kinda of show everybody what we've been doing. Thank you, Greg. As they mentioned, hi, my name's Aaron Wolford, and um, Really enjoy this project. It's really fun for me as a small kid. Grew up loving baseball, love numbers, love statistics, but that data means something. There's a reason we're tracking it. So why are we even testing analytics? Well, we're testing it, first of all, like you test anything, for faster feedback and alerting. We don't want to throw code out and find out two weeks after the fact that something broke and we're not tracking what we need to be tracking. Uh, it also ensures data in integrity. Are we getting the data back that we expect to see? Are the values within that accurate, it provides insight about our customers. How do our customers interact with our pages? Do they like videos? Do they like a specific type of content? Do they like articles or sports? And because it provides insight about our customers, it drives business decisions. And we use the data we get to make future decisions. Um, should we promote more videos, more galleries, more articles? And lastly, it affects our market perception. I'm gonna spend a lot of time today talking about Adobe Analytics. Uh, the newsrooms that we have use Adobe a lot. They get a lot of information from uh, what content they're viewing. I'm also gonna talk about Comscore real quick and, that, and the fact that it affects our market perception. Comscore is a company that collects data from all the industry. So they pull in Gannett data and then they show rankings of how we're being viewed. So if our 
call fires for Comscore, then we fall lower in the rankings. Then all of a sudden, New York Times looks like a better company than us, Washington Post, CNN.com, when really we still had the same number of viewers or maybe even more, we just broke an analytics call. We need to know about that, those things right away. I'm gonna take you through a journey of what we tested manually, how tedious of a process it was, and where we're at now and some things we're gonna to go to in the future. This is a spreadsheet we would get from business intelligence. Uh, this is specific to Adobe. I'm gonna talk a lot today about Adobe for a section front. A section front would just be all the content for one type of material, so sports. Uh, prop, prop values are what Adobe calls their tags, basically. Uh, in the code, it's gonna look like C, so I'm gonna use prop four and C4 uh, interchangeably as I uh, demo this today. Um, a couple to note here are prop eight, so that's just the domain, so are we on IndyStar, usatoday.com. Prop 12 is a timestamp, when did the, our customer visit our page, rounded to the nearest half hour. And prop 25 is an Adobe market name for just, it tags a suite. So we know we can filter the results for Indianapolis or Phoenix or Nashville. Some things to note are that it's specific to the page type. So business intelligence would send us multiple spreadsheets for videos, galleries, articles. Um, each page, as Greg showed, has multiple analytics calls. We could have up to 14 per call. Uh, the way we used to manually test this, say we open Chrome, um, you open the developer tools, go to the network tab, and uh, we're gonna find the information there. It's a very manual, very tedious process. And a company our size, multiple teams could affect the code. So an Adobe call could fail for just our account management pages or just for our video pages. So we need to have a very robust testing suite. And this is a sports section front, usatoday.com slash sports. Um, I've already got the uh, network tab open. So we load the page. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna search for the analytics call. I know from experience that's SREP data. Um, that's the fire for Adobe. Once we find that, we're gonna get the call. And underneath that, you're going to find all this messy data. It's ugly, it's not pretty, uh, and it takes a lot of time to just check off a checklist of the values from that spreadsheet I just shared. It's time consuming, it's messy, there's gotta be a better solution. So what we were able to do, I wanna give an example first of how, that was just one page. Um, this flag represents one market, and one market would be USA Today. I work out of the Indianapolis office, that would be the Indy Star. So we have one market. Underneath that we actually have three platforms we could be testing. It could be our apps, and for now we're working to combine them, but we have desktop and mobile web as separate code bases. So I could have two tests for the same page based on desktop or mobile web. Underneath that, the analytics suite has 10 page types. So now we're out to 30 tests, uh, as Greg shared. We have up to 14 providers. And checking each of those 14 gives us 400, over 400 tests. But that's just one market, and we are not just one market image shares, here's what 10 markets look like. Multiply by that by another 10 to get to 100 markets and you're looking at over 40,000 uh, test cases. We would never want to test all 40,000 test cases, but there's a lot of need and there's a manual part to updating the analytics where we need to test a lot of markets and we need to test a lot of values. Testing that manually would take forever and it's boring, I've done it. Um, so what we were able to find was that we can use SAS Labs extended debugging. Um, our code is out of Python, no business requirement from Sauce Labs or us, we just had developers that were familiar with Python. Um, if you're already testing with Sauce Labs, it's just an extra line of code within uh, your Sauce Labs setup. For us, it's desired capabilities, extended de debugging equals true. Um, what we're getting from that is the HAR file, and I'll talk more about that on the next slide, but you can also get the JavaScript console logs that will help you find some other errors or things that aren't loading correctly on your page. And the data is available on the view logs tab. When you run your tests on Sauce Labs, you can click on the view logs tab and get either file um, or through the REST API. Um, 
really helpful for debugging test and build performance. And since it's right there within your test already, faster root cause analysis, we're much more efficient by using the extended debugging. Har file, so we're all talking about today. Uh, this is a screenshot of one. I use Atom, my code out of Atom, so I always have it open. I usually just drag and drop. Not much to see here. It's just going to include all the network calls. Uh, Two things to point out is you can see the creator was the extended debugging service, and we're still talking about the usatoday.com support section front. Um, it's an HTTP archive format file. Um, download it quickly from Sauce Labs. Um, it includes all the network requests and responses. Uh, helps debugging things right on the spot. And for what I'm talking about today, you can view all the data within the calls. So the information within those calls you're able to see. So what's that look like? Process flow. We can run multiple tests concurrently. So uh, for us, a test case would be a market, a page type, and an analytics provider. We run several tests concurrently. So this could be six different page types, video, gallery, article. Uh, we send them over to SAS Labs as the pages load. And different page loads take different time. SAS Labs is going to get us those HAR files. We have code that comes back to us, so we receive the HAR files, and the first test step would be to parse the HAR file. What that means is just we're looking over, so from the screenshot, srepdata.usatoday.com would be something if we were testing for Adobe. But once we find that, we're going to get the, all the response data, so all that messy response that I showed. Uh, once we get the response data, we've got the list of values and what the expected values, and we're going to compare those two, and if all of them match, we're going to pass or we're going to fail the test. I'm going to give a quick demo. Uh, the real power in this is we run this job periodically throughout the day on Jenkins. Um, I'm going to kick these tests off manually and uh, walk you through what this looks like. So as I said, we test in Python, and I'm within a virtual environment. Uh, we run in PyTest. The dash K is I'm just tagging to run a short example for you. So we're just running the section front ones. And the dash in five is I'm going to run five concurrently. So the tests are going to kick off, and we've got tags in place. So you can see that we're testing Adobe Section Front. Uh, same thing I showed you, uh, Mac Chrome latest. Uh, and then the next thing is the markets. So you've got USA Today, Indy Star, and Ruidoso News. The last thing is the difference between our desktop versus mobile web. Tests are going to kick off on SAS Labs, all of them concurrently. Not a whole lot to see here, just because we're, what we're really using is the extended debugging and kind of the behind the scenes network calls. But as you can see, once the page loads, it's going to be the sports section front, similar to the screenshot that I shared earlier. And uh, so the page is loading, but what really is happening behind the scenes is the extended debugging and us getting the HAR file, and it's so much faster than manual testing. So what's happening right now is um, a little bit of a code snippet here. Um, the top line is looking for that SREP data call that I mentioned for Adobe, and we have it flexible enough that we have a config file so we can pull in different markets and still have the same test suite. So we can look for indiestar.com, usatoday.com, and just keep finding that uh, SREP data call for the same test. The next step would be we would get the response data, and then we would, for each page type, set the values. So this one's specific to that sports section front. And we're going to set the values similar to the business requirements from that spreadsheet. So we're going to set prop 4, prop 8, uh, prop 16. What that looks like in deeper detail is a little flexible. Um, for prop 8, it's just the first part of the URL. So nothing past the usatoday.com, indiestar.com. Prop 12 is time of day, rounded to the nearest half hour. The business requirement was not to actually test that it was rounding to the nearest half hour. It was just that it was formatted correctly. So we have a regular expression to make sure it's time of day, AM, PM. So all that's happening behind the scenes with extended debugging. And the tests are going to come back. And as they run, these are going to pass. And still got the same tags there for Adobe section front. Uh, the market and desktop versus mobile. The test passed, but let's say the tests don't pass or we need to find some more information. How are we using Sauce Labs to 
you get that information. This is the old UI, but it's still on the metadata tab or the view logs tab. You can find the HAR file in two places. Um, click on it, you download it, as I said. I usually just drag and drop to Atom. Um, once I get to Atom, it's going to look similar to the screenshot I shared. And um, extended debugging service, as you can see. And I'm going to search for that SREP data call. We're still testing Adobe. We're still testing the sports section front. It's not the first one. We've got code. We know which one to find. It's the post call. And when I scroll down here, you're going to see the same thing in the network tab that I shared. So all the information's there. Did the test fire because the call just never happened? Well, now no, I know that because I just found it. Well, maybe there was bad data. Maybe there was missing data. I'm able to look through this post and find out what went wrong uh, is one of the prop values for Adobe just missing. Um, here's prop 25. Um, the good thing is once I'm done writing the test and the tests are passing, I never have to look at this messy file again. It's great. I don't, I get a notification the test pass and I don't have to sort through all of this. So how is this helping? How is this helping the quality team? How is this helping the company? How is this helping development? Well, we've been able to see a 92% reduction in test time of kicking off a build for one market. It takes about 15 minutes. Uh, manually testing what we have now would take well over three hours. Doing some market research just based on testing salaries. It saves us almost $5,000 per market, but we're not just one market and we're just getting started. Uh, right now the test suite has four markets. Four markets adds up to almost $20,000. The cool thing about our code is it's flexible enough that we can add new markets within hours. It's not a problem at all. The test pulls in that, as you saw, the SREP data, and it knows just to look for the market, and now we're testing a new market. So we can add 60 to 80 tests within a day. So this number is going to keep growing in incrementally as we build out tests. We're focused on adding more providers. Uh, we haven't got to all 14 yet. Um, we're at nine. But as we build out those tests, then we can add more markets, and this number is going to continue to grow. Not only are we saving money on test time, but we're also finding things that is helping the company grow and eliminate bugs. Uh, one specific customer success story that we have is um, for a page like this. Uh, it's an article. You can see the text below, but it also has a video within it. So from our analytics, from an Adobe perspective, we're actually going to have two calls. We're going to have a call fire to track that our customer went to the article. We're also going to have a second one if the customer clicks play on the video. I have a second one. Our test ran late one afternoon at close of business, and the video f failed. First thing I did was download that HAR file, go look for the call, and it wasn't there. Well, maybe something's wrong with my code. Maybe I have a flaky test where I didn't allow the page to load long enough for that call to be picked up in the HAR file. We just grabbed the HAR file too soon. So I went out to the page, tested it manually. It wasn't there either. Well, maybe there's something wrong with just our specific page we're testing. So I went out and tested a few other ones. It wasn't there either. So then I knew something seems like something's going on. I alerted the video team, hey, I'm not seeing this. Uh, we're not getting Adobe calls for your videos. And they came back and after some back and forth, they realized, oh, yes, something did break. We did some config changes today. We tested a standalone video. The standalone video looked good and just moved on. Little did they realize at the time that it had actually impacted the videos that are on our article pages that are embedded right there. Um, they were able to open a ticket. It was fixed the next business day and calls were firing as we expected after that. Um, the good thing about that is I've talked to product managers. When this was tested manually, it wasn't tested very well either and there wasn't a lot of buy-in to test it because it was just kind of ugly. Um, I've talked to product managers where sometimes things wouldn't fire or different 
one or two values would fall off the Adobe call where it would go un unnoticed for two to three weeks. Newsrooms would see data dip low. Maybe it was just a slow news day. Maybe people weren't visiting our sites. And as time grows and those numbers still say low, hey, maybe we should look into this. Two weeks later, oh yeah, they made a code change that actually broke our analytics calls. Now we're able to find this same day, fix things same day. Um, because that data is not recoverable. We can always estimate how many people clicked on our new sites, clicked on our videos based on historical data, but we can never actually get those numbers back. So we need to find those things fast and we're able to do that with extended debugging. It's a really good uh, success story. Management was really proud. Not exactly a success story for Greg. He's a huge Penguins fan. He went to one of the games in the playoffs. They got swept and not happy about it. <laughs> So what's next? Um, we're still building out the test suite and we're almost done adding all the providers and we'll add in markets. Um, because multiple teams affect the code, we're just running it periodically throughout the day on our own Jenkins server. Um, we're gonna package this so that the teams can run their specific tests before they release the code. So it'll be built into their pipeline. They change code for whatever they're responsible for. Is it video? Is it desktop? Is it mobile web? They'll be able to run those tests, tag those tests specifically, and we'll know right away, have an even faster turnaround time on catching any potential bugs. Um, we're also still adding native app testing. We're not there yet. It's one of the next things we wanna tackle. And lastly, we wanna work with Sauce Labs on headless browser testing. They're not quite ready for that. I talked to them last night. I wanna be first in line to get it. Headless browser testing is really going to speed up our tests. Sometimes we have slow page load times and that makes the test run longer. Headless browsers, browser is gonna speed that up, which is doubly important because as we trigger these tests on builds within the individual teams, these tests are gonna run a lot more often. So we need that speed. That's where we are. Management's been really excited about this project. Uh, had a lot of eyes on it. Um, hopefully you've been able to think of some, even if you don't test analytics, hopefully you could think of some other ideas of how extended debugging could find some things that are hard to test within the network calls. Um, that's all I have. Um, I'd be glad to take any questions right now. First of all, thank you for the talk. Um, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, how do you manage uh, using PyTest um, kicking off all the different con uh, concurrent tests? Do you have like some way to uh, verify that you have available concurrency or do you just kick them off? Uh, we have a cron job that runs and right now um, our Jenkins server um, can't hold too large of a load, so um, we really only run two concurrently. When I run locally, I've ran up to 40 tests at a time, um, usually not a problem. Um, our test suite right now is at about 200 tests, so it takes a little while. Part of it's just our page load time, which is something the company is addressing as a need to um, grow in and just page load slow, which is obviously impacting performance. The extended debugging, grabbing that hard file takes a little time. But for now, we just run it on a cron job periodically throughout the day and we set the concurrency. We hard code that, so. Yeah, I think one, one of our challenges still is we're doing more and more automation and how can we get that scale? I always try to eliminate the bottleneck that the testing slowing down the pipeline. Um, Part of where my team was owning um, the CI infrastructure, we built our own hosted platform. Um, that's all using Jenkins, Docker, and Kubernetes. Um, there's a lot of auto scaling and stuff involved there. Um, it's about sizing that worker like Aaron's talking about. The workers are really set really small and we, we were kind of brainstorming last week of how not to put so much work on the actual worker itself, but actually kind of say, you know, how, how many nodes are available within this particular pod and say, how, how can we scale out that testing out that we can run faster? I think right now we're kind of maximizing the size of that worker right now 
and we know that we can easily start scaling that out a little bit more based on our namespace in Kubernetes. Yeah, that's another, another important thing. And why are we just testing four markets or 100 people, 100 markets? It's kind of a, a, a limitation we set on ourselves for now. We don't want these tests to run for hours. If we add 20 more markets, we could add 20 more markets. But um, the way our Jenkins server is set up right now, we want to keep it a little bit smaller. Because every market we add is going to add 80 tests to the test suite. So, Yeah, so I had a question. Uh, we have done a lot of proxy testing using like browser mob proxy run locally with the test worker and that works great for local like everything running on a machine. Um, but have, how, have you played around with that and how does that compare with it just downloading the HAR files straight from sauce labs and is there an advantage one way or the other? We did look at that. That was one of the tools we looked at, um, browser mob proxy. Um, I wasn't in all of that analysis, um, but we, when we compared the two, we found that Sauce Labs was the better solution for us, at least, and getting that HAR file was pretty seamless because a lot of the code we use and we test for other projects were already on Sauce Labs, so it was just one extra step that we were able to jump into. I think, yeah, I think there's pros and cons if you want to do browser mob. Um, the thing is, you're going through a proxy, and it's adding some more traffic going through something else. Um, extended debugger is actually literally talking to the browser, so it's going to be faster. Um, speed was one thing there. Um, there is a con in the sense, too, like what you kind of described there is having running something local is, you know, if something does go wrong in the sense of not saying the sauce will go down, but we all know that there's that disaster and recovery in the sense is we're highly depending on sauce to make sure that's working all the time. Um, but we're also taking that risk because of that, because it's, it is definitely faster running through the extended debugger because it's talking to the actual browser's API to kind of capture that hard file and everything. So we're, I know that they invest a lot of time in the extended debugger, and that's one of the reasons like I'm trying to push, and you want to vote for that you know, implementation of having the extended debugger on headless. Go ahead and go out there and vote on that. I'm <laughs> kind of crowdsourcing right now. but. Um, yeah. Yeah, we've done some analysis. We, we did browser mob early on. Um, it's definitely the speed thing for us, um, and that's why we wanted to go to headless more. No problem. Hey, uh, so how are we going to download the hard files for uh, the suites or each test? Or is it one file or multiple files? Is there any API to download all the hard files? For right now, it's one hard file for one test we've looked into and we, um, we have a spike out there to research why are we running multiple tests for the same page? If we're, a page loads and we have 14 analytics calls, why can't we just run, run tests and say, find all 14 of those for us? Um, part of it's just tagging so we know here's specifically what failed. Um, is it specific to Adobe? Is it specific to Chartbeat? We like that flexibility of knowing that we know all the details once we get a Slack notification or once we get a notification that it failed. But from a speed perspective, yes, we have looked into why are we just running, loading the same page because a page load may take time. Why are we loading the same page five times to get something that was already in the first file? Uh, question is, how do you handle verifying the same analytics call that happened on different pages? So, for example, like a page load that you want to verify, that you land on USA Today, you sign in, and you go, like that call will happen on every page. How do you verify that happened the right number of times, et cetera? Um, we have separate files for each page type, and within each page type, we say we need to check these explicit values. Okay. So are there any common calls at all that happen across pages? There are, okay. obviously. I mean, like time of day, obviously. Every time you look at a page, there's going to be time of day. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also, once you dig deeper into like articles versus videos especially, um, there's a lot of different calls. So we have different file types specific to Adobe, specific to Adobe Video, specific to Adobe Articles. So when you say load the page and look at those values that we're checking for, we're looking for check Adobe Video, check Adobe uh, gallery. Um, those are flagged in the config file. So the config file is the list of URLs we test, but we've got a tag for 
video gallery article, which we reference when we do the tests. And then from there, it calls that specific file. So we know if it's a gallery and it's going to look at the gallery file, then it was just going to be those props from those spreadsheets that we received. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, um, so in my organization, we are using um, Google Analytics. How Adobe Analytics is better than Google Analytics? The second question is uh, the HAR file, HTTP archive file that you have downloaded. Mm -hmm. It was a raw data. So who actually in your team makes it beautiful and present to the business team with a lot of figures and not fancy graphs? As to the first question, we actually use both. Um, our consumer marketing team uses Google Analytics. Um, they have a couple different calls they look for. Um, Adobe has just, I think, been around longer. Um, as our company evolved from newspapers to technology, Adobe was already ready with a suite we could implement. But we still use Google as well. And I didn't hear your second question over the clapping over here. OK. Uh, I felt Google Analytics was kind of simpler to implement than the Adobe that I was seeing uh, during this presentation. I don't know. Can you, I, it's hard to hear you. Can you get the mic a little closer? Oh, sorry. Um, I thought Google Analytics was easy to implement and maintain than Adobe the way I was seeing in the presentation slide. Um, do you feel the same or no? Yeah, I don't think we've ever done the analysis of which one's better or another. I know we, we use Adobe's analytics. It's been kind of part of it when it was amateur before that, you know, from that side of it. So um, as we continue to make that push into Google, like there's always that opportunity to kind of like do an analysis, but I don't think we've actually done an analysis between the two to see which one's more efficient than the other. So okay. I don't know if we really have an answer to that one exactly. Um, and then what was your second question? Uh, my second question was the HAR file, the HTTP archive file that you downloaded from SaaS Lab mm -hmm. site. It was a raw data. So who is your team actually, you know, uh, make this, uh, I mean, parse these file or whatever and makes it into, you know, nice fancy graphs, uh, makes it beautiful. Who does that in your team? Yeah, the R file is messy. Um, usually for a page load, it's about 20, it's over 20,000 lines of code or of response data. <clears throat> but we have the code within the Python project that just looks over it. I never have to look at a HAR file unless the test fails. Um, but it's just a manual. I go look at it, I download it. I click on the link and download it and look for, do a search for what I need to. Um, but within the code, we have code just to go find what we need and pull that in and validate that the response was what we expected it to be. Yeah, so Aaron and Hemo that's working on this project pretty much massages that in the sense of the test and understanding how, what to actually kind of like parse through on the hard fall to ensure that everything is like firing off correctly. So I was wondering whether the intention of this test is to make sure some kind of video rendered in the page or the right kind of video? Um, it's more making sure that they're being triggered. Um, it's kind of, we're using as a test, but also monitoring the, the changes too. So that's why kind of at the beginning when I was saying monitoring and testing, it's kind of how we're leveraging it. Um, it's not about making sure that the video actually renders, it's making sure that when the video is clicked, it's actually firing the right type of analytics calls. Right. Um, for a, a media company, it's really critical for us to make sure that those things are firing, to make sure that we can continue to say we're one of the top, you know, largest media companies out there that gets the most, you know, hit, you know, page views and things like that. Um, there's other types of tests to make sure that the videos are actually operating, you know, we build our own actual video player and we're making sure the video player, so those are a separate suite of tests oh, in itself. Okay. Clear. Thanks. Thank you all. I think we're out of, I think we're out of time. Um, we need to lunch. Yeah, so if you all have any other questions, you can hit up, you know, Aaron or myself uh, throughout the conference and thank you for everybody coming. Thank you.